I'm Lisa, and this is part two of the reading about uh, mass murder, serial killer stuff, uh, about the dark chapter novel thing. Um, reminder, Extreme Killing, third edition, Understanding Serial and Mass Murder by James Allen Fox and Jack Levin. Okay, so back to where we started. Craving attention section. Not only is the value of multiple murder artwork and music inflated, but their statements to the press, both spoken and written, also are treated as words of wisdom. Suddenly they become instant experts in everything from psychology to criminal justice. The media often solicit their opinions about how victims might protect themselves from murder. What motivates other serial killers in the role of pornography in the development of a sexual sadist? In fact, Ted Bundy's expert testimony on the eve of his execution concerning the dangers of erotic materials become ammunition for ultra-conservative groups lobbying for federal anti-pornography legislation widely called the Bundy Build. 38-year-old serial killer Leslie Allen Williams, after his 1992 arrest under suspicion for the slayings of four women, exploited the Detroit area media to the hilt. Rather than giving an interview to every media outlet that wanted one, Williams took requests. In a contest the outcome of which he alone would decide, one local television station won an exclusive interview with the serial killer. In addition, one daily paper, the Detroit News, was chosen for the privilege of printing his 24-page open letter to the public that expounded on the theories and philosophy of Leslie Williams. Anyone who would question whether this was a privilege for the Detroit News should consider what it did to boost street sales over its competitor. The relationship between the media and serial killers has become so intertwined that it has been described as symbiotic. The media seek the attention of their captivated audience by exploiting its interests in, in scintillating themes. For their part, the murderers look to the media to help them construct their serial killer identities. In fact, reading their own press clippings helps them to complete an identity transformation in the same way that reading the press does for athletes and entertainers. Donald Harvey, who confessed to killing scores of patients while working as an orderly in Cincinnati area hospitals, agreed to a taped face-to-face -face interview with popular talk show host Oprah Winfrey as a part of a show on nurses who kill. During the tape segment, Harvey visibly showed enjoyment in recounting the details of how he killed his victims. He described with glee how he had injected some with poisons and had suffocated others. Realizing that Harvey was having the time of his life talking about the murdering patients, producers of the Oprah Winfrey show wisely decided that would be insensitive, if not unethical, to air the program and canceled it. By doing so, the producers deprived Harvey of a chance for stardom on a national stage. The show's producers correctly recognized the fine but critical line that divides informed analysis from unhealthy glorification. Well, I'm glad they realized that. I think one of my friends, uh, Casey, did her uh, paper over Donald Harvey. Next section, killer communication. Some Americans disparagingly refer to serial killers as animals, of course only in a figurative sense. Actually, what distinguishes humans from animals is the ability to communicate verbally and in writing. And some serial killers have, in fact, chosen to react out through such means to contact the police, the press, or the public. Letter carrier David Berkowitz initially labeled the point, uh, the point forty-four caliber killer, the point forty-four caliber killer. Um, for his repeated gun assaults on young couples in parked cars in 1976 and 1977, did more than just tote the mail. During his killing spree, Berkowitz sent a series of letters to the Brush New York Post, columnist Jimmy Breslin. Besides his lengthy and sometimes incoherent ramblings, Berkowitz offered the police a bit of assistance with Breslin 
as a go-between in the closing of one of his notes. P.S. Please inform all the detectives working on the case that I wish them luck. Keep them digging. Drive on. Think positive. Here's some clues to help you along. The Duke of Death. The Wicked King Wicker. The 22 Disciples of Hell. John Wheaties. Rapist and suffocator of young girls. At the same time, Berkowitz was displeased about his newfound public image. The killer wrote a letter of complaint to Captain Joe Borelli of the NYPD, hoping to set the record straight. I am deeply hurt by the newspaper calling me a woman hater. I am not. But I am a monster. I am a little brat. I am the son of Sam. Unlike Berkowitz, most serial killers elect strategically to remain silent regarding their identity and their activities. Some murderers at large, those who are social isolates, isolates in personality, resist any impulse to go public out of their own personal awkwardness and discomfort in interpersonal relations. Others recognize that killing under the radar is most ad advantageous for continuing their crime sprees without detection or apprehension, that is, if pleasure and fantasy fulfillment are what motivates them. Of course, not all repeat killers are driven by sexual sadism or the need to dominate their victims. Certain motivations for murder necessitate that the killer expose and publicize his or her existence, if not identi identity. One type of power fulfillment involves not so much dominating innocent victims, but spreading fear throughout a community, gripping an entire city or region in an atmosphere of panic and hysteria. In a series of chilling unsolved homicides beginning in the mid 1970s. For example, the unidentified killer began writing to the police and the media. His one way communication intensified the level of fear and apprehension among residents of the previously relaxed Midwestern community. Early on in his crime spree, the killer phoned a local newspaper reporter and directed him to the locate a mechanical engineering textbook on the shelves of the which to public library. Inside the text, the reporter found a letter in which the writer claimed credit for the recent massacre of a local family and promised more of the same in the future. In his letter, the killer wrote, The code words for me will be, find them, torture them, kill them. He signed the letter BTK Strangler for bind, torture, and kill. The BTK moniker, monitor, moniker <laughs> originated with the killer himself, it was commonly used by newspaper reporters in their articles about a string of seven murders. In January 1978, BTK sent a poem to a reporter at the Wicked Eagle Beacon, in which he wrote about a victim he had slain a year earlier. In February of the same year, BTK wrote a letter to the town's television station complaining about the lack of publicity he had received for his murders. How many do I have to kill? BTK asked before I get my name in the paper or some national attention. In addition, the killer compared his crimes with those of Jack the Ripper, Son of Sam, and the Hillside Strangler. BTK's killing spree apparently ended in 1977. The murders seemed to have stopped. The leads in the case never panned out, and the media no longer heard from the killer. After more than 25 years, however, BTK resurfaced to terrorize the Wicca community again. In 2004, the Wicca Eagle, Wichita Eagle, marked the 30th anniversary of BTK by speculating what had become of his fate. The man had moved away, was imprisoned for some other crime or had died, according to various theories. Feeling challenged and wanting everyone to know that none of those hypotheses were, was true, BTK reopened lines of one-way communication, insisting that he had been around town all along. 
In a letter addressed to the Eagle, the retired serial killer included his usual contrived BTK return address and enclosed a photocopy of a missing driver's license belonging to a woman who had been strangled in 1986 and copies of three snapshots of her body lying in front of her television. BTK was back. Back not to resume his killing spree, but only to toy with the police and the press for his enjoyment and fame. He even went so far as to send out a word puzzle created from a computerized spreadsheet which contained various hidden clues about his identity and whereabouts. It is arguable that he had resurfaced in part because of his feelings slighted and upstaged by contemporary serial killers such as DC snipers who were publicized all over the internet and cable television. Of course, these communication outlets were not in existence during BTK's prime crime years. Unfortunately for him, but fortunately for the residents of Wicca, the BTK Strangler's ego and narcissism were his downfall. The police were able to trace the IP internet protocol address of the computer he had used to create the puzzle. That being a desktop machine located at Christ Lutheran Church in Wicca, it didn't take the authorities long to identify the source, Dennis Rader, the president of the Congregation Council. And that is a picture of him. He's white. He has a mustache. He has glasses. And he's almost having a fryer hairstyle. But he still has some hair up there. Um, Radar mistakenly believed that he and the... Well... Okay, yeah. Radar mistakenly believed that he and a police lieutenant of the Wicca Police Department shared a special bond. Radar must have been disappointed when he learned the police reassurances that a floppy disk could not be traced back to a specific computer were false. Even following his capture, Dennis Radar couldn't resist the urge to talk with the cops about his crimes. Having failed in his life's ambitions to join the police force, he chatted with the detectives as if he was one of the guys. Radar described his arrest and admission of responsibility to Harvard University psychologist Robert Mendoza. I saw this whole line of police cars. That's not good. And they were right on me. Just that quick. I thought maybe it was the traffic stop or something. But as soon as one of them's behind me with the red lights and sirens, I knew that was it. They pulled guns on me, told me to lay down, and I sprawled out and they grabbed me real quick like in handcuffs and stuck me in a car. Mr. Radar, do you know why you're going downtown? And I said, oh, I have suspicions. Why? At first it was kind of, kind of a cat and a mouse game. But they had a suspect, but it, but it, but it did kind of hurt, you know? Like you said, I had the power, you know? I was a law enforcement officer, technically, and here I am. These law enforcement officers were trying to do my duties. That kind of hurt a little bit. I know a lot of police terminology. I know how they do things. So yeah, it's kind of a botting type thing, you know? I enjoyed it. And once the confession was out and I admitted who I was, then, then the bonding really started. You know, I just really opened up. And you know, we shared jokes and everything else. It's just like we were buddies. For some serial killers, boasting about their violent exploits is more accurately an act of taunting. Out of sheer arrogance, certain killers tease the police of, or the public with a you-can't-catch-me message. For them, winning the cat-and-mouse game with law enforcement is a powerful fringe benefit to their killing sprees, potentially as fulfilling as the homicides themselves. And... Um, hmm. Radar taunted the police by sending a word puzzle containing hidden clues to his identity. I kind of want to do this later, but it's right there, which you can't really see, but it's a bunch of letters. California Zodiac Killer, whose first suspected murder, that of Sherry Joe Bates, dated back to 1966. 
appeared unconcerned about being captured as he sent letter after letter to the newspapers claiming intellectual superiority over the police. Even his first communique, well, I don't know why that's in French, uh, received by the Riverside Police Department in November 1966, long before he had established his elusiveness, tauntingly announced his intentions. His use of capital letters reflected a certain bravado and confidence. She was young and beautiful, but now she is battered and dead. She is not the first, and she will not be the last. I lay awake nights thinking about my next victim. Maybe she will be the beautiful blonde that babysits near the little store and walks down the dark alley each evening about seven. Or maybe she will be the shapely brunette that said no when I asked her for a date in high school. But maybe it will not be either. But I shall cut off her female parts and deposit them for the whole city to see. So don't make it easy for me. Keep your sisters, daughters, and wives off the streets and alleys. Miss Bates was stupid. She went up to she went to the slaughter like a lamb. She did not put up a struggle. It was a ball. I first cut the middle wire from the distributor. Then I waited for her in the library and followed her out about two minutes. The battery must have been about dead by then. I then offered to help. She was then very willing to talk to me. I told her that my car was down the street and that I would give her a lift home. When we were away from the library and walking, I said it was about time. She asked me, about time for what? I said it was about time for her to die. I grabbed her around the neck with my hand over her mouth and my other hand with a small knife at her throat. She went very willingly. Her breast felt warm and very firm under my hands, but only one thing was on my mind, making her pay for all the brush-offs that she had given me during the years prior. She died hard. She squirmed and shook as I choked her, and her lips twitched. She let out a scream once, and I kicked her in the head to shut her up. I plunged the knife into her, and it broke. I then finished the job by cutting her throat. I am not sick. I am insane. But that will not stop the game. This letter should be published for all to read it. It just might save that girl in the alley, but that's up to you. It will be on your conscience, not mine. Yes, I did make that call to you also. Here's just a warning. Beware. I am stalking your girls now. CC Chief of Police Enterprise. Three years later, the killer's communications, both letters and phone calls, picked up in, in pace. He also adopted the sign of Z the Zodiac, as well as its name, as his calling card in the monogram for the murder. The moniker also only intensified the frightfulness of the assailant, whom police would never identif identify. There are two general cases, mm, there are two general classes of multiple murderers based on their motivation. Those who find killing a fulfilling end in itself, and those for whom murder is a necessary but not necessarily desirable means toward some larger objective, often political or profit-based. The former is focused squarely on the act of killing, whereas the latter generally requires communication with third parties to get their compliance. For the DC snipers who gunned down 10 innocent people near the nation's capital during a three-week period in 2002, Communication with the investigative for task force and ideally its leader, Chief Charles Moose of the Montgomery County Police, was necessary to gain their ultimate prize, a ransom of $10 million. Through notes left at the sites of shootings, one of which was scribbled on a tarot card for added effect, the killers gave instructions for the head of the task force to read at a press conference the phrase, We have caught the sniper like a duck in a noose, adapted from the children's folk tale. The snipers later identified as John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo were frustrated in their repeated attempts to reach the man in charge who could authorize the transfer of funds to a stolen debit account. For Muhammad and Malvo, communication was nothing more than negotiation for profit. Unlike the DC snipers, Theodore Kaczynski, the central figure in the 2011 GSA auction, 
mentioned earlier, was a prolific communicator and relentless negotiator. Given the moniker that un- the Unabomber created by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, for his series of bombings directed at university-based scientists and airline executives, Kaczynski was focused on advancing his cause rather than seeking profit, power, or revenge. He wished to send a clear message of impending doom to alert the nation to what he saw as evils of technology, and he used murder and threat of further bombings in order to get everyone's attention. Despite his distorted view, Kaczynski was a brilliant individual, a Harvard-trained PhD in mathematics who landed a coveted teaching position at the University of California. But he also struggled with mental illness throughout his life. As he withdrew deeper and deeper into minimalist ideology and schizophrenia, Kaczynski abandoned his teaching post and moved to a remote spot in Lincoln, Montana to take up a simple reclusive existence. Quick little um, interruption. Uh, People who have mental illness are actually less likely to be violent than people without mental illness. It's just a stigma people have. So you're more likely to get hurt by someone who does, uh, by a neighbor who doesn't have mental illness than if you had a neighbor who who is a schizophrenic. They're more likely to do harm to themselves than to you, just so you know. So you're aware of that stigma. From his tiny secluded cabin, lacking in the basic form, comforts of electricity or running water, Kaczynski toiled away making bombs and sending occasional letters to the New York Times outlining his outlook and philosophy excerpts of which were published by the Times in hope that someone would recognize the ideas and phrasing. More importantly, Kaczynski spent long hours publishing his 35,000 word treatise, treatise, uh, treatise, uh, industrial society in its future, in which he warned of the dangers of human enslavement to technology. The Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. They have greatly increased the life expectancy of those of us who live in advanced countries, but they have destabilized society, have made life unfulfilling, have subjected human beings to indignities, have led to widespread psychological suffering in the third world to physical suffering as well, and have inflicted severe damage on the natural world. The continued development of technology will worsen the situation. It will certainly subject human beings to greater indignities and inflict greater damage on the natural world. It will probably lead to greater social disruption and psychological suffering, and it may lead to increased physical suffering even in advanced countries. Kaczynski sent copies of his work to both the New York Times and the Washington Post. Along with the ultimatum, either his document is published, unedited in its entirety, or more people will die. With advice from the FBI, the Post calculated to the killer's coercive tactics and published the manifesto as an eight-page supplement to its September 1995 edition. Um, next section, killer groupies. Killer groupies. Because of their celebrity status, infamous multiple murderers attract a surprising number of extreme sympathizers, so-called killer groupies. Several convicted serial killers such as Hillside Stranglers, Kenneth Bianchi, and Angelo Biono were pursued and married while serving life sentences for their brutal and sadistic murders of young women on the West Coast. Other multiple murderers have married from death row, giving the traditional vow till death do us part, an ironic twist. The pattern of behavior is sufficiently common to have been assigned to a clinical label, hybristophilia, a paraphilia in which someone is sexually aroused or attracted to a person who has committed particularly vicious or gruesome crimes. In its more common form, hybristophiles merely seek to be close to some bad boy. Occasionally, however, hybristophilia can lead to behaviors far more dangerous than mere adoration and devotion, including participating in murder for the sake of their loved one. So why would someone in their right mind correspond with, visit, or even fall in love with a man who has raped, tortured, and mutilated innocent victims? 
Why would hundreds of women attempt to visit Los Angeles Night Stalker Richard Ramirez, who was convicted of stealthily entering more than a dozen homes in the dark of night and killing the occupants? And why would so many women send proposals of marriage to suspected repeat killer Horan Van Der Sloot just days after his incarceration in the country of Peru? Why would a woman like Veronica Crompton be so attracted to Sunset Strip killer Douglas Clark that she would break off her relationship with Hillside Strangler Kenneth Bianchi, but, and only, after she had committed a copycat crime in hopes of exonerating her incarcerated her boyfriend? Actually, there are several reasons why serial killers are pursued by adoring women. Some groupies may be attracted to their idols controlling manipulative personalities. A Freudian might attempt to trace his attraction to a woman's need to resurrect her relationship with a cruel, domineering father figure. At least a few killer groupies strive to prove that their lover is a victim of injustice. These women fight for rights, give their otherwise unfulfilling lives a strong sense of purpose. Others wish to break through the killer's vicious facade without or with thoughts such as the whole world sees Johnny as a monster. Only I see the kindness in him in him. He shares that only with me. I feel so special. Still, other devotees simply are comfortable in always knowing where their man is at 2 a.m., even if it's on death row. He may be behind bars, but at least he's not out in the bars with some other woman. Dozens of women write their love letters to Danny Rowling, the serial killer who in 1990 brutally murdered five college students in Gainesville, Florida. One enduring fan wrote to the killer, I fell in love the first time I saw you. I've even seen you in my dreams. You're a very handsome man. A 29-year-old woman sent rolling bikini-clad photos of herself and wrote, I love you with all my heart. I don't care what you've done in the past. I wish I could hold you and comfort you. She addressed her letter to my sweet prince. Many other women sent rolling red roses, locks of their hair, and love poetry. Some sprinkled their letters with perfume and begged the killer to allow them to visit. Of course, Rowling's 2006 execution put an end to the romantic fantasies of many adoring fans. In the picture, under the picture, the caption says, The celebrity of killers often attracts adoring fans, groupies, even marriage proposals. A spokesman for a San Quentin prison holds a photo of night stalker Richard Ramirez and his new bride, Doreen Loyola, I don't know how to say last name, taken during their wedding ceremony inside the picture. Inside the prison. Hmm. People are crazy. Underlying all these motivations, however, are the glamour and celebrity status that killer groupies find exciting. One teenager from Milwaukee appeared years ago on a national TV talk show to admit that she would give anything to get an autograph from a serial killer, Jeffrey Dahmer. It is likely that she has also collected the autographs of rock stars or rap artists. The young girl never got her wish fulfilled before Dahmer was murdered by a fellow inmate. In general, serial killers are more accessible than other celebrities. If a fan wants to get close to a rock idol Justin Timberlake or rapper Eminem, she generally doesn't have a chance. But with someone like Night Stalker Richard Ramirez, all she would have to do is write a few gushy love letters. She might even get to meet him and perhaps even marry him. After watching the TV coverage of Ramirez's 1985 arrest, Doreen, a freelance magazine writer, carried on a decade-long courtship with a convicted serial killer. Following her 1996 marriage to the condemned inmate, Doreen Ramirez told CNN, He's kind. He's funny. He's charming. I think he's really a great person. He's my best friend. He's my buddy. Because her husband was on death row, Doreen was not permitted conjugal visitation at any time. Despite the physical limitations, marriage survived until 2013 when Richard Ramirez suffered a fatal heart attack. The impact of celebrating murders. Murderers. As a glorification of multiple murder, trading cards, art galleries, song fests, and killer groupies, nothing more than harmless media hype? Certainly the families of murder victims don't think so. From their point of view, the sanitized, romanticized, and glamorized image of the killer who is, in actuality, little more than an unrepentant, vicious, sadistic destroyer of human life only adds insult to injury. The harm extends well beyond the victims and their loved ones. 
Worshipping a killer whose actions are so hideous that he ought to be soundly condemned debases our entire society. Making monsters into celebrities only teaches our youngsters, especially alienated and marginalized teenagers, a lesson about how to get attention. Want to be noticed? Want to feel important? Simple. Shoot lots of your classmates. Then you'll be on the cover of People magazine. You'll be interviewed on CNN, and you'll make headlines all over the nation, if not the world. Columbine High Shooters, Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris, appeared on the cover of Time magazine under the headline, The Monsters Next Door. Adult readers may indeed have viewed them as monsters, but how many teen young teens instead saw them as more celebrities and heroes? From the perspective of a few alienated youngsters, not only did Klebold and Harris get even with the bullies in the drop. Sensitize, not sanitize. Author Lonnie Kidd might have recklessly, albeit unwittingly, put a stamp of approval on murder with his failed attempt at satire. His 1992 book, Becoming a Successful Mass Murder or Serial Killer, The Complete Handbook, might easily be misunderstood as a murder how as a murder how-to book by people who are looking for an excuse to kill. In a section titled To Get Rid of Your Children, Your Spouse's Children, Others' Children, for example, kids suggests, you will have no problem finding lots of brat children to kill. They are also easily convinced to go off alone with you. You could easily beat them to death, kick and stomp their little faces and heads into the ground, hear them promise to be good little boys and girls, but you know better. They will continue to be little brats if you do not do away with them. And a disclaimer, Kidd argues that his book is a way of calling attention to a very serious phenomenon in a satirical, such, satirical, whatever, manner. Notwithstanding the legitimacy of his avowed objective, not all of Kidd's readers would possess the sophistication needed to get the joke. Those who are already predisposed to mayhem and murder might instead find plenty of encouragement in the pages of Kidd's troubling manual. In the pages to follow, we certainly do not strive to enhance multiple murder celebrity. Rather, we hope to shed light, but not a spotlight, on the motivation and character of these vicious killers. We appreciate the important distinction between analyzing the gory details of a crime and glorifying the image of a criminal. At times, we describe the sickening circumstances of a multiple murder, but always with a purpose. To remind us that the killers are monsters, undeserving of celebration and fanfare. At the same time, we must be nothing less than candid about what atrocities modern-day serial mass killers have committed. Leaving out the gruesome details might reduce the reader's discomfort, but it would inadvertently minimize the horror of the murders and maximize sympathy for the perpetua perpetuators. Anyways, thanks for listening. That was the end of chapter one. Have a good day.